Welcome, welcome, welcome to AI in Education. What do we need to know? I need to know everything. So hopefully Rochelle is going to let us know about AI in Education today. I am pumped up and I am Dr. Desiree Alexander. I am the founder CEO of Educator Alexander Consulting and I am your host for today. Hello. These are all of the different ways you can contact me. And if you are watching this on the YouTube channel, know that right under the video, you can get the link for the resource for today. It's in the description underneath the video. So we don't have many announcements because in December, we're going to announce all of the upcoming webinars for the spring. So I cannot wait. I'm so excited. We have about 10 right now um, and we're, we keep getting requests. So we keep scheduling more and I'm I love it. I love it. But so far, we have TCEA conference in January slash February. Um, I, this is even out of date because I have one more session that we added. And then we have Educate Alexander will be at IdeaCon, at FETC. So there's so much that we're going to be announcing in December. I can't wait. We do have two BER sessions, which are paid sessions. Maximizing the Power of Google Classroom Using Cutting Edge Tools and ELA Teachers 20 Best Technology Tools. So these are both coming up in the spring. So just start looking out for that, at least the spring semester, I should say. Uh, you, you can start looking out for that. We always have our self-paced online courses for Google Level 1, Google Level 2, and the SLLA, Educational Leadership Test. So again, that's all we're really going to announce today. Remember, you can always tell us what webinars you want to see or what webinars you want to present at any time, but everything else will be announced in December. A, a nice little present for any holiday that you may celebrate in December. Okay, so we are going to go ahead and get started with AI in education. Well, thank you, Dr. Desiree Alexander, again, for an opportunity to be here on a Saturday and learning with other educators. And before I share the screen and dive in, I'm curious in the chat if you would put in um, how familiar you are with things related to AI, whether in the classroom or just general knowledge about artificial intelligence, uh, if you're already teaching students about it, if there's a favorite site that you have that you use to teach students, you know, what's your level of comfort or knowledge or understanding or anything about it that you would type in and share just to give me an idea. Uh, and then, of course, any questions that you have along the way, drop those into the chat. I will highly encourage some multitasking during the time that we'll spend here together today because I'll share some like background with you, some uh, big ideas where you see AI in the world, what it might impact or what the impact might be in education, and then some different tools and, and websites and things that you can use to get started with, whether for just you know your own kind of exploration and also the, um, you know, preparing our students, but then just something that's fun too, that you may not necessarily realize, because when I started to learn about AI, I really didn't know that much at all. I also thought that because I, you know, I teach STEAM, which I can, I teach about AI in my eighth grade STEAM course, but as a Spanish teacher, I would often say, well, I, I can't teach about, you know, like augmented virtual reality or artificial intelligence in my Spanish class, or I've heard elementary school teachers or math teachers uh, or different, you know, content areas, whatever grade level say, well, I teach this course, I can't have students do things related to AI, but we all can and we need to. And there's lots of resources out there, of course, some which are free and some which are paid. And so I'll share some of those with you today and encourage you to dive in and try some things, tweet some things out as well. And then I have a really cool uh, other resource that I started to use and test out that I'm going to share with you that is uh, basically an artificial intelligence. It's coaching. So if you in your school don't really have a lot of tech coaches or you're looking for feedback on your you know, teaching practice and instructional strategies, which can be a little bit uncomfortable sometimes with observations. And you're like, I just really want to know for myself. There is this tool that I, I tested out on my own in my classroom that I'm going to share with you. And I'll share a code with you that you can try it out as well too. So we will go ahead and dive in and thanks for dropping in, you know, your experience 
Uh, and again, you know, I, well, first I should say I am not an expert by any means, but I'm just somebody who really likes to learn and share and hopefully make it easier for everybody else as well. So as you've heard, it's AI in education and what do we need to know? So my contact information is on there. Uh, if you have questions, if you have resources to share, anything like that, or something comes to mind after, make sure that you send me a message because I am happy to help if I can. If I don't know the answer, I would certainly find you the answer. So a couple of things about me. I did mention I teach Spanish and STEAM. I started to really dive into artificial intelligence uh, almost five years ago now, actually. It might even be a little bit beyond that. I lose track of time over the last couple of years. But the reason was that in my STEAM course, I was teaching about augmented virtual reality and it's focused on emerging technologies. And I was just curious about it. And I didn't really know a lot. And I'm a blogger for a couple of different publications, one of which is Getting Smart. And they had themes each month. And for a while, I was writing blogs about things I was doing in my classroom to share ideas. And it was it was easy to do that because I'm like, oh, today we use these different tools for game-based learning, for example. But I wasn't challenging myself to learn more. So this one month, it was in January of that year, they had AI listed. And I thought, hmm, I think I'm going to write about this. So I did some research. And I was like, wow, I had no idea because in my mind, I had a perception of what AI was. So here's the next question for you. In the chat, when I say AI, artificial intelligence, what comes to mind? Like, is it a technology? Is there a TV show, a movie, something? What do you think of first whenever you hear AI? And I you know, just out of curiosity to see what people think of. So that was the start of it. So since then, I have been you know, teaching about it in my Spanish class also, because we use, well, we kind of use translation uh, tools sometimes to check things, but there is something that I help to work on for ISTE for AI and some lesson plans about the use of translators. So I dove into it with them a little bit in Spanish, but also in my STEAM class. And I've been writing about it, presenting on it for a while and just keep continuing to learn more. So there is a lot to know, and I'm hoping today to share some ideas with you. So the first thing is if you're looking to start teaching about AI, in your classroom. And I know the video, the, the sound is not playing, but I like to just play it in the background so you can see some images and get some ideas. But if you're thinking about getting started with it in your classroom, my advice is one, don't worry about being an expert because I'm not an expert, like I keep saying. Two, just have a, a starting point of where you wanna go with it. So do you want students to just initially understand what artificial intelligence is, then have a discussion about it? And then dive into where are we seeing AI in our everyday lives? What is the impact of AI on our life or what's the potential impact on our lives in the future, whether in education or work that artificial intelligence might make? Um, I dive in with my students asking them, like I asked you, like, what do you think of when you hear AI? And actually, let me minimize this for a second so I can see the chat here to get some of your ideas. But the video, robots and things, yep, always the robots. And that's exactly what I thought about as well. And with my students, we have a conversation and we do look at definitions of AI. And then we have examples of it and just continue to, you know, think about like, well, how does it benefit you? Did you know that AI is in this thing that you're using or this app or, and as you can see on the screen, which is playing again, the things that you might not even realize, which is what happened to me when I wrote that first article, I went, I had no idea how much I'm interacting with and relying on AI every single day. And I spoke with a company from the UK probably about four years ago. And the man who was the CEO and the founder of this company that dealt in machine learning and artificial intelligence said, the thing about AI is when it's doing what it's supposed to do, like you don't know it, it just facilitates whatever it's been programmed to do. So with my students, the video and all of the materials that you'll see that I share here, whether it's a, a screenshot, a link, the name of a tool, a resource, a website, they are all linked in my document of resources that you'll have access to. So this video has, uh, it's from Crash Course. And I use it with my students all the time. And so depending on what you teach, if you have an extended period of time to dive into AI, for example, you could go through the series and talk about the basic, what is artificial intelligence, then machine learning. And there are like progressively more advanced topics that really get into like AI at a very complex level. But for my class, for my students, we just look at the video 
And then we have a discussion and then it kind of goes from there, which I'm going to take you through that process the same way that I do with my students. The other videos uh, that are linked, I have a YouTube list that I've shared in the document. So there are some really awesome humanoid robots that are out there. And to see like some of them are like the top 10 or the five fastest or the most innovative. And just to get students ideas, because the thing that I think is the most, I don't know, awesome is that I think back to when I was in eighth grade, which was a while ago, and how things are so different. And like, who would have thought from the time when I was in eighth grade, all the technology that we have available to us today. And it's great. But then also the other part of it that we get into is, you know, what are the concerns that we have? And AI is a topic that you could spend like its own class. And I've had students say to me, I wish we had a course on ethics and learning about, you know, bias in particular when it comes to artificial intelligence and to really be able to dive into some of those discussions. And th that was coming from eighth graders, um, which we do talk about those topics in my class, but we don't get to spend as much time as I would like to because the year long course, we cover AI and AR, VR and metaverse and a lot of other topics. Although we do start with digital citizenship too. So I played the video. And then the other part is that we have conversations, but then we look at the specific definitions. And so my students often will Google these terms and write down these really lengthy definitions. And I said, okay, that's great. But if somebody stopped you and said, hey, you took a STEAM course, you learned about AI, what's AI? Are you going to be able to pull like pull that paper out? I mean, of course that person could Google it. I said, but what if somebody just wanted a really quick, like an elevator pitch, short explanation of what AI is. Could you give them a definition? Could you give some examples at least that would enable them enable them to understand it? So when it comes to AI and machine learning, often people might, I don't want to say confuse the two terms, but think that they're one and the same. And actually machine learning is a component of artificial intelligence. When it comes to AI, one example would be a Google search. Uh, if anybody can think back to doing research for reports and projects and things growing up and you had to go to the library and rely on the Dewey Decimal System and go find the books and that whole process and all of the time that that took to finally find the book from the shelf with all of the, the numbering and to sit down and go flip through all the pages to realize like there's really nothing here versus now when we Google something and you get millions and billions of results in let, like sometimes even like a third of a second if not even less because it is sorting through all of this information it's casting this big net to find what you're looking for. But also with AI, it can go through and kind of like our brain sorts through and processes information, but it does it at like an unbelievably fast rate of speed. So AI, which we'll see some examples here coming up, is one definition that my students need to understand. But then also machine learning, where if you have, you know, if I give you a problem to do, or if you're looking for trends and looking at statistics, for example, like a human can go through. And if students, if you have one student and you have all of their assessments and their papers or projects or whatever it is, but you have them answer questions and you go through and you sort and you can start to see that, oh, they're missing verb conjugations, like in my case for a Spanish teacher, for example, or I see there's this pattern. We can do that, and it's important that we do that, and we connect with our students to give feedback, but it is time-consuming, and we know that for students to learn, like, they need to have feedback faster, like, timely, authentic, meaningful feedback. When we have these different tools available, many of which we're using in our classrooms, where the students can take a quiz, or they can play a game, and we get that information, and it shows, like, patterns in what they've, you know, how they've responded. It can analyze it, whether individually or as a whole. That is machine learning and the machine improves and gets better with time, but it's not at the level of artificial intelligence. Um, another term that we talk about is a neural network, which think of your brain. If I ask you a problem like what's three plus two, or can you name five fruits, for example? So you kind of sort through all of the other information is there and kind of knock things out of the way as you process it. So when it comes to you know, computer programming and artificial intelligence and algorithms, the neural network is basically our brain, but it just does it that much faster. And then there's also the deep neural network and it's very co complex, which not gonna go into all of that, but for my students, I just want them to understand like the basic and some of the key terms. And then we, we dive into using some different tools. A couple of other terms, natural long language processing, which NLP. Uh, and for anybody who, this is something that I do as well. If you look, if you are looking for like breaking news or certain terms that you want to learn more about with Google, you can set up 
uh, a Google alert. And when you do that, if you want to learn more about, say, artificial intelligence or teaching in elementary school or natural language processing, for example, you type that in as your search term. And the beauty of you know Google going out, it pulls in whatever news has happened related to those terms, and it sends you an email every single morning or however often you set it up. And I get a lot of emails that come in on these topics, but I want to keep up with what is happening about AI or about machine learning or whatever the topic is maybe related to my STEAM course. And I could go on the internet, I could do the Google search myself, but it's not giving me the most up-to-date when I do that. I have to set the filters. But when you set those alerts up, you can get that information really quickly. Uh, when it comes to a topic like natural language processing, thinking about if you rely on your phone for voice to text, for example, or if you engage with a chat bot and you have that conversation and it's processing or can mimic a human conversation. And sometimes even when you make a phone call, I know when I've called for Apple support at different points, you know, it's a person it's, it's a recorded voice. It's, it's a generated voice. But based on what you say, you are having a conversation and that's based on this NLP. And so the thing that's kind of interesting is like students can create chatbots, for example. Uh, there have been teachers who have created chatbots for libraries. Uh, for their classroom to respond to commonly asked questions. So in your role, think about if you find yourself saying like the same thing over and over, or the example like a library uh, for, for one friend of mine, uh, she heard of a, another librarian who had created a chatbot for students or anybody who would come in and ask the same question about like taking out a book or where to find certain materials. It was programmed so that it could give that information so she didn't have to keep saying the same thing over and over. Um, deep learning is a type of machine learning, and it's like a massive network, and then a CAPTCHA code. And I'm sure that we've all had to take that test where you've gone on a website, and before you hit submit, you have to prove that you're not a robot. And sometimes it's just a quick click. I'm not a robot and you move on. Sometimes it's that code that you're like, I can't tell what those curvy letters are. Uh, do I have to write them capital lowercase? Sometimes it's the pictures and you have to click which one has a tractor, which one has a bus and so forth and do that repeatedly. Well, the reason for that is because Alan Turing had created this test and that cap just stands for what you see on there that completely automated. And it was based, or it was created to determine whether it was a human or a computer. And so the question, if any of you, especially in the last couple of years, have ordered tickets through Ticketmaster, and if you can think back to maybe years ago, if you ever wanted to attend a conference, or not a conference, I'm at a conference right now, a concert or an event, people would go to, like in, in, where I live near Pittsburgh, we would go to the supermarket and they had a Ticketmaster counter. Or you would go to where the event was being held and people would sleep out and camp out for days. But then when the computers were able to then order tickets, this, this was created to distinguish between if it was a human putting in the information or if it was a program that had been generated to buy up all of those tickets. And so that's why that exists. And even now with like that, that two-step authentication so that it, you know, computers can be programmed to do tasks that are done by humans. And so to kind of rule it out where you know, it's time consuming. And, and sometimes I get it wrong, right? I'm like, I did click all the traffic lights and then I get another one and it can be super frustrating, but in the end, it's meant to benefit all of us. So one other thing to say is artificial intelligence. The concern is, is it going to take away my job, especially in education? Say, is it going to replace teachers? Uh, there's a really good site website that I'm going to share with you here shortly, but this quote I came across in one of my readings um, last year, and it's, I, mean, I won't necessarily read it to you, but think about different things that we do in education. So if a student takes you know, a test on paper, we go through it. If we're reading their handwriting, depending on the writing itself, that is time consuming. If we give them a quiz or a test or some activity and it's auto graded, uh, somebody who is potentially you know, an accountant, for example, then all of those kind of tasks can be automated. And so this quote, you know, what's easy to measure is easy to automate. And so if you think of different jobs in the world that can be done with a program or things that you might do, you know, doing your taxes, for example, um, there's all of these softwares that you yourself could do it and work through it versus going to somebody for that. So there is a site, like I said, that I'm going to share with you shortly. Now, here are some different statistics that I had gotten from an article. Uh, a couple of them are like two years old, but 
uh, still relevant. So one example that I always love to share is almost 100 years ago in New York City, which coincidentally, I'm actually in New York right now for a conference, there were traffic cops who were manually switching the lights for all of the cars. And what happened? Well, we had automation. So then they didn't need to have those traffic cops there. Did they all lose their jobs? Not all of them. Some of them probably did, but many of them shifted into other types of work. Uh, some of the other statistics that you can see then read on the screen, but just the different predictions about the increase in the use of AI and how it will automate production of 30% of the content available on the internet by the end of this year, which it's almost the end of this year. So those types of things, that's why as educators, we need to be aware of like, how is AI impacting the world? Because for our students, depending on the grade level you teach, the content area, just thinking forward, you know, if you have students that are thinking about doing one type of work in the future, and we see the trends where AI is going to change, and that job is going to either like, you know, decrease the need for people in that job, or it's going to be replaced by AI, we want to support our students to develop skills and enable them to be flexible for whatever the changing you know, world of work and education is going to look like. Uh, the other piece I thought was interesting was about the robots replacing humans in jobs by one of every four by the year 2030. So think about things like factories uh, where, you know, you have workers that are moving things, delivery like Amazon. I mean, some of these are already using, you know, autonomous vehicles and drones for deliveries. So it is important to see what the changes are going to be. Now, there are a lot of benefits as well. Uh, and I can tell you some stories here. And, and this is what I'm, what I'm sharing with you now is not what I do all in just one class period with my students, but over a course of you know a couple of weeks. And then I give them a lot of time in between to go and explore some of the sites I'm gonna share here with you. But just for talking points, uh, I think it's important to have some ideas to share with students as well. The biggest impact that I noticed in terms of like the last five or so years that I've been really focusing on it has been in healthcare. And there was this big uptick in AI related news in the healthcare field back in March of 2020 moving forward, because what they were doing is they were using uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence to look at chest x-rays of lung scans, for example. And think about if you've ever had a test like an MRI or a CT scan or anything where you've had to wait for a week, two weeks, a couple of weeks, however long, and that can be, you know, Hopefully everything works out well and you get good results, but for something that could be serious, you know, somebody has a CT scan of the brain, for example, you want to know those results quickly. What they've been doing is, especially with COVID, is using this technology to be able to look at all of these x-rays and process thousands upon thousands of them because the computers, the algorithms have been trained and programmed to recognize when there might be a spot on the lung or a lesion on the brain, for example. And they can go through it. Now, could it make mistakes? Of course, because the AI has been programmed by a human and humans can make errors, but that's when the human steps in. So let's say they've scanned 4,000 x-rays and they have models of this is what a healthy lung looks like, for example, and this is what a lung with, you know, some kind of a mark would potentially lead a doctor to want to investigate further with additional tests. So it ended up making it so that they could process those results quicker and get people more medical attention that they needed in a, a faster way. Um, robots for robo advisors. So think about your finances. If you have you know, investments or anything and you talk to somebody one-on-one -on -one who's your advisor, your accountant, for example, a financial advisor, they artificial intelligence can process large amounts of data and can do transactions. It learns over time. It understands you know, your spending and the types of interactions that you have. Uh, with travel, anybody who's used, you know, Uber and those types of things, it can analyze like the traffic patterns. We have autonomous vehicles. There is a prediction. I don't want to spoil it yet, but there's a prediction that a, a, like millions of autonomous vehicles will be on the roads, I think by the year 2045. And I asked my students, would you want one? Some of them are like, oh yeah, that'd be awesome. And I said, yeah, I wouldn't mind having one just on occasion to, you know, have an extra 30 minute nap in the morning. But the reason that they say they wouldn't necessarily is because that concern, like, well, what if there are people in the road or, you know, like, how do you know that it's safe? And I said, well, you don't, because at the end of the day, it's still humans that are programming and creating these algorithms. And so it takes a lot of study to get everything ready and trial and error to do that. Uh, 
this one may be scary for any elementary teachers who are joining in. The 40% of tasks by elementary teachers could be automated by 2030, which depending on what those tasks may be, might not be a bad thing. Because I know as educators, we have so many things that we have to keep up with that are time consuming and using, you know, assessing students and being able to see their work whether they write an essay or they solve problems in math or they create something for me in Spanish, just for a few examples. But it does take time to go through that. And if it can facilitate us providing feedback to our students quicker that helps them to learn and to really understand where they are in the learning process, then those are definitely benefits. But we don't want to take away that human interaction, that piece of actually giving them that authentic and meaningful feedback that we can. It's just saving us some time. And we definitely wouldn't mind getting some time back. Wikipedia, everybody loves Wikipedia. My students always want to go to Wikipedia, but volunteer bots. So could you imagine as you know a human, if you have a job and you are an editor and you're told, hey, you know what? You have to do 80 million edits. You're like, how much time do I have to do this? Well, <laughs> Wikipedia has bots that take care of this and they have fixer bots and they have volunteer bots that go through and do all of these edits in the content that's on Wikipedia. So I just like to share some of those. Uh, top trends for 2022, here are some areas. And these may be things that you are using, like the voice or facial recognition, for example, on your phones. A lot of my students have the iPhones, they use the facial recognition, um, cybersecurity. And in the chat, if anybody would like to type in, why do you think there was an increase in attacks? And I'm gonna pause here just to check out the chat. If you have any ideas, of why would the cybersecurity go up? Would love to know. I think you could probably take a good guess. Money. And think about since like 2020, what the impact might be. And I can give you a hint. We all experienced this probably in the last two years, whether a t as an educator or in the world of work scams too, all the time, right? It's because so many people relied on technology to keep learning and the world of work going that it opened up a lot of, I mean, higher usage. So there were a lot more breaches and then you have cybersecurity needs. So for students who are interested in some of these fields, like cybersecurity is a <laughs> definitely a growing field, but a lot of these areas, um, even like creative AI, the metaverse, I, I just joined in a conference, a fantastic, unbelievable event last weekend it was the Ed3 DAO. Um, if you are not familiar, it is based, it was based on Web3, Web 3.0 in education. And it was three days last weekend. You can check out their site. Uh, I think I might even have the link in my resources, but it was like an experience in the metaverse but helping students to understand this. But AI is the number one skill that's in demand. And so helping students, oops, I'm gonna skip that one, uh, learn about it. So with education, how can it help us or help our students? Well, here are six different ways that it can help or impact us in the world that we live in as educators, but even just in general, uh, for communicating, whether we're you know teaching or communicating with students, or are students learning to communicate and rely on some of the tools like the voice to text, for example, um, the ways that we get information and access it in, in a faster way, but even as teachers, being able to differentiate and personalize learning. So there are tools that now many of these ed tech tools that we are already using are starting to really increase what they offer for educators. And they're putting, you know, programming in place that runs based on artificial intelligence so that if students all start an activity together, then when it when they answer the question, whether they answer it correctly or incorrectly, the AI that's built into that program can create their own personalized learning path for them. So a couple of years ago, there was a tool that was called Socrates. I almost said Socrates, but Socrates and it was for, at the time, I believe third and fifth grade, it had math and I think ELA, I think were the two. And my eighth graders, I like to get them to kind of beta test a lot of these different things. So I said, well, today we're going to do third grade math. They weren't that thrilled at first. So I had, I think, four students at one bank of computers and I assigned them a task and they all started at the same time, but they all got different questions as they progressed because how quickly they answered right or wrong it then gave them different questions based on, you know, as the computer, as the program was kind of figuring out like, oh, well, they're missing this same, you know, aspect of the math problem solving 
whatever they were doing, then it could give them more questions like that. Or if they were getting everything correct, then it could just keep giving them new content. Uh, one of my students actually became a little bit bored with a third grade math and decided to change the coding of the the, um, the website where it had a chariot. And as students got the answers correct, it would move forward. So the student hacked into the coding and made it so that that chariot actually ran off on the side of the screen. So I was like, well, there's that. But for us, you know, being able to give students more personalized experiences and differentiate learning for them, that is where the AI can be helpful. With uh, my my start in diving into AI and learning about it, like I said, I wrote the blog and then I really did just start teaching students about it when I didn't know that much at all. But then I was fortunate to take the ISTE course. So if anybody is a, a member of ISTE, they have this course. And I was in the first group that it was um, funded with a grant from GM Motors. Yeah, Dura Motors. And I think there were 500 educators that took part in this course. And that was kind of like over the summer of that same year when I first started to learn by AI. And then I felt way more confident diving in the following year. But these, this is just one image from the materials in the course. And I actually do have a lot of other resources to share with you. But if you're looking to get started and you think like, yeah, you know, I would really like to take a course that has different materials and standards and lesson plans and books and everything like that, then I would recommend checking out um, ISTU, the courses that they have. But I do have some other materials to share. Okay. This is one that I'm going to ask you for some participation. I'm going to minimize the screen so I can see the chat. But here are 10 everyday uses of AI. And I do this with my students. So give yourself a point for every one of these 10 that you use on a mostly everyday basis. I mean, commuting, you may not use Uber every single day, but maybe a couple of times a week, depending on, you know, if you're traveling or your line of work. But give yourself a point. And if you wouldn't mind in the chat, Type in the number that you get, because I'm always curious. I've had students who type in an eight, which surprises me. For myself, for up until November of 2020, I was only at uh, a seven because I had never watched Netflix. But then November 2020 seemed like a decent time to actually watch Netflix. And so I've been holding steadily at an eight. Wow, a two, that's awesome. The with my students, I guess a lot of the time, and I'll say, Well, you probably aren't using it for commuting, right? And a couple of years ago, one of my students said, Yeah, I use Uber all the time. I went, Why do you need to use Uber? And he said, Uber Eats. And I said, Okay, well, I hope you're getting something good. You know, and I'm from Pittsburgh. So I'm thinking, like, if this if this 10th grader is using Uber Eats, he's probably getting something that's you know far away from his home. He was using it for McDonald's, and I said, Wait, you mean the McDonald's that's like right down from the school that's not that far from your house? He said, yeah. And I said, you could actually walk there. He said, well, I was kind of tired. I'm like, I cannot believe he's using Uber Eats to get McDonald's. So the students are using so many of these. I mean, the facial recognition. Uh, but think about you know, what are the benefits of these things? And for me, when I think about going on Amazon, like, let's say I want a book and I'm like, I have no idea what kind of book I want, but I've ordered books before. It gives you, you know, some suggestions or people that order this book also order these books that you might like, or on um, social media. I know that this happens a lot, a lot more than I'd like. You Google something and the next thing you know, you go onto Facebook or somewhere and you start seeing the ads for these. It's because everything is interconnected. Netflix, you watch a show and it's like, you might like this. You're like, why, thank you. I would love that. So it there is a convenience to it. Even with email, you may wonder about the AI. It starts to recognize things that you might mark as spam or how you file things. And so then if you ever wondered why, wait a minute, why is this person all of a sudden in my spam folder or junk folder, it may be because one or two times you might have marked it as spam, whether accidentally or intentionally. And then it, it tracks that and it starts to do it for you. So these are, this is another thing, like I said, with my students that I tend to do. Now, here's where we'll dive in and do some experimenting. So I will encourage you. And then I would love for some of these, if you, you know, tweet it out just to share what you might create. But one thing that I can say is there are enough resources out there that are available for free and that provide a ton of things for students to explore. And I think that's the key. And for me, for a long time, I felt like I had to be the only provider of knowledge in my classroom. I just had to keep, like I am right now, I've been talking, 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 that's going to change. But 
And I worried about having enough content, but there's a lot of things out there that we can explore, but also give our students the chance to explore. So one is Microsoft has this AI for good. And for teachers, you know, when you're looking at different websites and things and wondering about, you know, if they're age appropriate or if they're up to date or they're reliable, uh, you can count on this one, the Microsoft AI for good, to find some activities that enable you as a teacher to not have to worry about spending a ton of time looking and sorting through everything that's out there and know that the materials that you're using are going to be beneficial, that they're accurate and relevant for students. Uh, IBM has a program and a course for chatbots for good. So students can build their own chatbots. And even if you're looking for things like social emotional learning, for example, or STEM, uh, I know that for some teachers, especially, I mean, even for me, I think like, well, I wanna do project-based learning. I wanna make sure I'm focusing on social emotional learning skills. It's important that students have access to STEM learning opportunities because there's gonna be like three and a half million jobs that are related to STEM skills in, by the year 2025. So I'm like, how do I do all these things? Well, the nice thing is that you can find a topic that ties into all of those. So let's say that you want students to learn about artificial intelligence. You want to dive into project-based learning. And like I mentioned, the SEL and also um, the STEM, it all fits nicely together. So maybe you have students work together and figure out why they might want to create a chatbot, uh, looking at empathy, for example, or design thinking and all of those processes that students that can help students to like really focus on the process of learning and to develop a lot of those skills that tie into social emotional learning. And they could create a chatbot. Uh, you could also have them explore the use of chatbots. One, whether it's on a website, it pops up like, hello, I'm, you know, has a name, I'm a chatbot. How can I help you today? And you type in some keywords, like let's say Amazon. I had a book delivered about a year and a half ago and it Everything looked correct. The order was right. It showed that it was delivered. Even on the site, it said this was the book that was delivered. It was not the right book. I had ordered my friend Jillian's uh, book, Lives Seashells. And when I opened the package with her, like we did a live, like it was supposed to be like a book reveal. I was like, yeah, hey, I got your book. It was a book about like seven financial habits that you should have from like 1989 or something. And so I'm like, this is not even the book I ordered. So I went on Amazon, the chatbot popped up and it, how can I help you today? And I went wrong order. And then it's been programmed. It says, so you've had a problem with your order. And then it said, let me check your recent orders, recent orders book. Is this the, the order you're referring to? Yes. And then just through that, I didn't have to talk to a person. It handled it. It automatically sent the right book. And that was the end of it. So you can have students create chatbots, but those are two really good resources. Now, the one that I'm going to encourage you to go to and open up a tab on, I'm going to actually do that here as well, is Google AI Experiments. So let me switch because I do have the tab open and I'm checking, oh yeah, use it for everything. Okay. So Google AI Experiments, as per the easiest thing to do, Google, I tell my students, go Google AI Experiments. So it opens up. And when you get there, if you are doing this with me, excuse me, you have lots of different collections. Um, and my students, you know, if I hover over the collections, you can see all the different topics. So even if you're looking at other topics besides AI, like augmented virtual reality, that's also available within, within this AI experiments and experiments with Google. So what we do normally is go through some of the same things that I've been doing here with you today and talk about the AI and do that, you know, how many of, out of these 10, look at definitions, look at some resources. And then I usually head to this Google um, experiments and I'll show them some examples of like, oh, you like to draw? Here's some with, with drawing or you like art or music. I, I can give you a warning, depending on the class that you choose to use this with, this Freddie meter could be really awesome or kind of you want to have some earplugs in, but the, the student, like they love it. Um, there's a duet and it's a piano that responds to you, but there are a lot of different choices here. My students did this lip sync one, uh, a teachable machine where, you know, you can take a bottle and you hold the bottle and then you show your face and then you go back and you train it to distinguish between what is your face and what is not. And that's how it does, you know, the facial recognition, for example, uh, but it's machine learning and the students don't have to have any great skills to do it, it takes them through the process. There are some body movements. You can be like a conductor of an orchestra, for example, and just scrolling through, there's some games, some mantras, which I'll show you here. Uh, Beat Blender, which they can go through. And some of these I will veer you away from. There is one that has birds. Uh, this infinite drum machine is a, 
it's neat, but it's also, you might want to have students turn the volume down a little bit because it can be a little much if they're all doing the same thing at the same time. So let me go to this quick draw. So in quick draw, and anybody who is in here, if you've used quick draw, if you would type a, a Y in the chat, that would be awesome. I'm just curious, but it's a lot of fun to do this quick draw. Now, what it does is it uses a big data set. And so think about if you've ever played, um, I can't even think of what it is. Well, if you've ever done something like even charades, for example, or win, lose, or draw, uh, it's great. Yes, it is a great icebreaker activity. Then our brains, if somebody's actually drawing, you know, on paper, you're eliminating things that like, if somebody's drawing a square, you're not thinking of things that are circles, for example. And that's what this does. So when students do this, and when I demo this for them, it's usually pretty entertaining. So it gives you an item and you have to draw it. So I'm going to draw and it'll say like, what, it, and this is going to be terrible. Okay, so got cake. And you and I recommend that you do this as well and see how you do. But you it talks to you. Yay. Okay, so you'll do, oh goodness, a horse. This is, okay. <laughs> I don't know how I got that that was a horse. An anvil. I, oh. I can think of it, but. Okay, bird. All right. I, I think I can do this one. <laughs> okay. Octopus. All right. So this is, this is the fat. And then it gives you your six well drawn. I wouldn't say that was well drawn or not, but if you are doing this on your own, it's a lot of fun. But what you can do is you ask students like, well, how did it know? Like, why didn't it guess? And one time I did this at a conference and I had to draw, you know, very simple things. And then it went to the Great Wall of China. And I'm like, how am I going to draw this? And right before that, I had to draw a washer and it did not guess the washer. Then I got the Great Wall of China. And in my mind, I'm like, okay. So, and I had a room of people there. And so I started to draw what looked like Lego blocks, Lego bricks. And it goes, oh, I know Great Wall of China. And I said, how did it guess Great Wall of China from that? And it couldn't guess like a washer, but it goes through the different data sets. And so as I click on the data, it shows you all of these different drawings and it 15 million players. So it takes the drawings of other players. So somebody who may have drawn equally as poorly as I just did in most of those pictures, it has those in there. So maybe that's how it recognized that I was drawing a horse, even though that did not look like a horse. But it's pretty neat to do that and to help students to understand, you know, like the neural network and how it works and it sorts through the information that isn't relevant at the time. So that is a great one to use uh, that I always start with. And then another one that I recommend, and actually I'll show you this one because it's pretty neat. Uh, and I know I don't think I have the sound set up, so good good for you, bad for me. But it has all of these different lights that you can see, and it's it's still loading. And you can see on the right how many sounds. And you might think I had no idea there were that many sounds. Well, it's still going. It's only eighty percent right now. But with my students, and I have a Promethean board in my room, I, I demonstrate all of these. And actually, what's a lot of fun for them too is whenever they get to do that AI, the quick draw on the Promethean, you know, like the big space. So now this has a bag of chips. So if I click on it it'll make the different sound. So the thing is you can create your own kind of music. So if I drag this, you didn't hear it, but if you do it on your own screen, you'll hear this screeching sound. Um, you can move them over. And then if you hit play, it'll go through and play each of those and you can see them lighting up. And then you could also remix it and have different ones. So like you can kind of have it mix up, but it has all of those sounds and then it learns patterns and students can create their beats. So sometimes it does actually like sound really neat. Sometimes it's really awful, but it's just another way to like meet students' interests, especially if they're into art or music. Uh, some students really like to do the uh, Symantris, which is another one that I have them do. And this is good too, especially if you're looking at, maybe you teach elementary for, uh, you know, a certain content area, you know, 
well, elementary teachers, you teach everything. So you have a lot to do. So you could certainly bring this in. And what I like about this for all grade levels, but also specifically for elementary is the, this using words. And so you have two different ways to do this. One requires typing. So depending on the age of your learners, maybe that might not be the best choice if they're just learning. You know, I didn't have typing in high school or any level of school at all until I was an adult. So I had to teach myself. But for younger students, that might be a little bit you know, frustrating at times or time consuming or depending on the devices. But I like this block one. And the reason I like this is because you have all these different words. And so, and I'm going to actually mute the sound here, but you see different words that are in the space and you have to think, and this one you do have to type, but it's not like a speed kind of typing. So what you try to do is you try to think of a word that is related to the words that are on the screen. And for students who are you know, building language skills and whatever grade level, they're learning, they're thinking about the words, okay, what's a category? So it's not just like, oh, it's a fun game, because it is a fun game, but you think, hmm, what does it have in common? So I'm like, okay, there's ocean, rain, ice. So anybody, I have a word in mind that I think that I'm thinking of typing in, but if anybody has a suggestion, I'll be curious if it's the same one. So the goal is to get as many blocks of the same color knocked out at the same time. And when I first demo this, I'll ask my students for some ideas and I'll type it in and then I'll let them go and explore on their own. So if anybody has any idea, you can type it in the chat or you can try this on your own. But the word I was thinking of typing in was water. So when I type in water, it says, let's see if AI understands which block you're talking about. So it should, I'm hoping, knock out a few. It only guessed ice, which is curious because ocean is water. And now, connected to those. So then you get points and then you get another chance and it like knocks those out. Other blocks would appear, you get a score. So I'm going to try type in, uh, let's see, I'll type in blue is probably a bad one. I'll type in warm. <laughs> okay. That's interesting. Snow is warm. <laughs> I don't know how that worked, but I'll do one more. I'll type in orange and see if it gets it only got sun. I thought for sure it would get Halloween, but I've had students who come up with, and it just like all of these words, but it gets them to think about something at a higher level, like the words, what they mean, and then what's a connecting piece, and then to have fun playing the game. So this AI experiments, there are a lot of things like cartoonify, but students, again, depending on the age that you're working with, maybe you want to just give them two to, to try out, uh, a lot of my students like this teachable machine where you show them, like I said, like it's a water bottle, it's not. The singing, depending on your space. And if you don't have access to a lot of devices, sometimes just setting up like stations to use with some of these, you know, having the Microsoft AI for good, having the Google experiments, for example. So that is, that, those are a couple. So let me head back over to uh, this. So there are some other ideas that you can use. AI. Uh, experiments is the first one that I start with. Then there's another one that's the Akinator, which I will open up. And I'm, if you've used this, then you, you are familiar with how much fun it can be. But the Akinator guesses, it's the web genius, the web genie, is supposed to try to guess a real or fictional character that you're thinking about. And when I did this the very first time as a Spanish teacher, I was like, oh, I'll think about Don Quixote. It'll never guess it. It guessed it in 16 guesses. So the point is you want to try to think of somebody or something, because it could be an object or an animal, that it may not guess, and it has to go through and think and analyze based on your responses. So I'm going to think about um, Wonder Woman. So that's a character. So it'll load a question. You, I recommend you do this as well. And you don't have to do use Wonder Woman. Is my character real? Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, she is. I'm going to put no, I guess, because... Does she have a human head? Yes. And it'll go through and ask you different questions. And sometimes you may not know. And so, oh, I should have hit no for that one. Dark hair. All right. And when I, I don't think she goes to school anymore. When I first did this, I started to realize like, oh my goodness, this is going to guess Don Quixote. It was really, really amazing. Animated. I'm going to say no, but even though there was a cartoon. So he's thinking, so he might be on to it. Yeah, there was a comic book. Goodness. And then some of the questions you're like, ah, I'm not so sure. But you want to be careful with the gray level that you're using this with too, because sometimes some of the questions might be a little sketchy. From Legally Bond, no. 
So I'm clearly going to stump this one, but it's it's fun to sometimes demo. And even maybe for students, um, depending on the grade level that you teach or work with, you might want to just model it. Or if you're working with teachers, oh yeah, it does use a rope. Oh, I forget if she's part of the Justice League or not. That, I should know that. Yay, 22. So it gets in 22. That's better than my Don Quixote day one. But it's just interesting. And so the conversation piece is going through and saying like, well, how does it know? Well, there's been a program. It's like an if this, then that. It's like a flow chart. And so it goes through. And whenever you say like, I don't know, probably not, that makes it a little bit more difficult for it because it's not definitive. But sometimes you can start to see the pattern. You're like, it is totally going to guess who I was thinking of. Now, sometimes my students in the eighth grade, they were like thinking about their classmate. I said, it's not going to guess that the person sitting next to you or your teacher, but it's just another way to show them like that process, like the logic kind of of it and like the steps in a process. There is also, and these, again, all these materials and links are all in uh, my document, which is why it's easier to share that with you than the slides. But there are some low cost AI projects for kids. And this I got earlier this year. Oops. And here are some different things. And I just thought this was a great resource to share because it talks about you know, where you might see AI and some different activities. So like the chatbot, like I mentioned, um, there is facial recognition. There's another game about a gesture controlled space game battle and a plagiarism checker. So you can explore those as well. But I wanted to show you what that looked like. And I like things that are like free or low cost. MIT has a lot of great resources as well for creating a chatbot, also for training a robot. And so let me skip to this one. I'll show you some images. And this is where I would love to see what you create. And if you would tweet it out and tag me and tag AI Club because uh, Nisha Talagala uh, Dr. Nisha Talagawa has a, a book that is phenomenal that I, I read this summer, actually, and it has so many ideas and, and how to get started with teaching AI and examples. I mean, it is just a great resource to have, but I like this site because it offers a lot. Like if you are looking for bringing curriculum into your classroom and you want something that has like the standards and has resources and students can access and it has support for parents as well. But they also have some fun activities that are available for free, which I'm going to show you. But they, the resources they offer go from K through 12 and they can be used for older students also. And I know that a, a question is like, well, you know, I teach kindergarten or first grade. Like, what can I do? Well, there are a lot of great activities. Or even with these fun activities I'm going to show you here, it, it tends to say grades five through eight, but you can use them with older students too, because the goal is to help them to understand these concepts like artificial intelligence and machine learning and where we're seeing them and what the, you know, what the impact is. And then also thinking about, you know, what is something that they might create with it? So with AI Club, some of the things they have, like there are different activities. So on the left, you can see I have, I took screenshots of it, but they do have AI ethics and have some resources and materials for students to go through and think about, you know, the ethics of artificial intelligence. Also looking at um, the understanding of language, like I mentioned before that natural language processing. And then I said, what do you think about when you think about AI It's like robots, but then they have different activities. So on the top right, there's a cat, which is not surprising because I always pick a cat and it has like this cool background. Well, AI can generate art and music and fake news. And there's, you know, the deep fakes. It's all of these things that we're seeing that it's, it's really hard to tell sometimes, like, did a human write that or was it created by AI? Uh, if anybody had even seen America's Got Talent, I think it was with Simon Kyle, where they brought on somebody who was singing and they used, it was deep fakes and they projected using special equipment with that AI in it. And it looked like Simon was actually singing the song, but it wasn't him. And that was on, I think that was like from five months ago. But uh, anyway, it can take a style of art or theme and a picture and mesh them and generate something new. And so, for example, Game of Thrones books, they, uh, they fed like all of the information from those first books into a program. And then based on what was written in those books and the style and the characters and all of that, it generated another one. They've taken music from different artists and mixed artist music even to generate what it might be. Uh, news headlines and things can be generated. There is something called GPT-3, which it generates text and news. And there are, uh, there's a link in my document that is, uh, is it human or AI? And it has music, art, images of people. And then it also has some memes 
and it has uh, some poems and short excerpts of things. And you're supposed to go through and say whether you think it was AI or a human created. And you'll be surprised at the results uh, when you go through it. So this AI club, here's what I would love for you to try. And you can share if you want to. It's always fun to see. But they have this new, uh, actually newer from this summer. On the bottom right, it generates what you would be like as a cartoon character. So what you do is you either use your webcam to take a selfie or you can upload your own image and then it analyzes whichever you use, your selfie or the image, and it creates a cartoon character for you. Now, sometimes, you know, if you have glasses, uh, it may or may not have those glasses represented. My students had a ton of fun doing this. So let me, oh yeah, I will type that in for you, uh, the name of the book shortly here. I'll actually share it on this site. So if I go to AI Club and let me copy this direct link into the chat here, make it easier. So this is where you can find some different activities. And again, it, you know, the grade band can be, when I talked to um, Nisha is her first name, she mentioned, you know, grades five through eight, but I use this with my eighth graders. I've also shared this with older students. You know, can AI do your homework, emotions, the telephone game, Chai the AI bot. There's a lot of options, but here's your cartoon avatar. So what you could do is you could take a picture. So this could be a little risky here. I don't know. Hang on. I've never done this live. We'll see what happens. And it'll change me. Oh, that's, <laughs> I'm going to select it from a file. That one was very interesting. So let me pick, I'll try not to do the same one that I used the, on the previous screen. So I'll use that one and we'll see as it generates. Oh, no, it's the same exact one. So you could see what you would look like as a cartoon character. So that's Tunify, which is a newer one. And then as far as resources, they have all of these different things that you can go through. They have books um, for elementary, middle, and high school. And the book that I mentioned here should be on one of these pages. So for students, you know, AI on our phones, in space, health, there's a series of books that are available. And then also, oh, let me get to the right one here, go on this one. This is the book that I was mentioning. Uh, it's it's a phenomenal book. It is it's a thick book that has so many different things in there. It has definitions. It has uh, examples of everything you need. It has activities, ideas for projects. But Dr. Nisha Talayala is. I just actually spoke with her earlier this week about um, some different things, and that book is it's great. This one and there's another one that I'll recommend that I have in my resources for you to check out. But especially if you're looking to get started with it. Uh, for the different resources, there's projects, you're, you are welcome. And this is also interesting because sometimes students, and I mean, we do this as adults too, but sometimes students say like, you know, there's no way that I can do this or it's too hard. And I will show them projects that have been done by like third and fourth graders. I'm like, look what they've created. Like, you don't know what you can do until you try and giving them that support. So here are some different blogs. Uh, but if I go to, let's see, the students, link. They have <clears throat> different sessions they had offered where students did different things like for voting and AI for social good. So if you're looking at you know, developing social emotional learning skills, social awareness, anybody who works with um, or teaches students about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is an example where you can use you know, so AI for social good, for example, and have students create something. But they have this program that's for students in middle or high school levels where they can do you know, their own projects, they can engage in competitions, sometimes write papers, but they have courses also available, which again, you know, with my students, we, we go through a lot of these materials, but sometimes it's nice whenever you do have an actual course to explore that has everything that you need and broken down based on the grade level that you want. So I, I like the AI club, especially the cartoon one that you can use. And then some other resources here, uh, the ISTE, this other book, let me maximize this again. So when I took the ISTE U course, there was a book written by Michelle Zimmerman, which is teaching AI. And I am not at home right now, but if I were on the side of my desk, I have a collection of books that are there because I reference them often. And Michelle's book, Teaching AI, and also the Artificial Intelligence Education book are like side by side right next to me because for a teacher and teaching AI is available through ISTE. 
And that was part of what I had gotten from that course. But in that book, and it, it was probably from, I think, three and a half years ago now, but it goes through everything. It goes through like the start of AI. It gives you the standards, especially if you're looking to align with the standards, uh, the ISTE standards for students or for educators, definitions, lesson plans, activities. I mean, you name it, it goes through everything. And so I keep that one there. And that was wonderful to have when I went into my, my next year of bringing AI into the classroom. Now, if you also want to know about AI and education, like at a higher level and know the history of it, the research, the like big groundbreaking things that are like on the timeline, the progress that was made, this book, it's like a red, it's a smaller, it's a paperback. It's a, it's a lot of information, but that is another book that I read um, that really dives into, you know, how do we get to where we are today? Who were the people that were involved? Uh, so, you know, from Pittsburgh, there's a lot of work related to artificial intelligence that has been done in Pittsburgh. So I'm very thankful that I have access to a lot of that, especially through Carnegie Mellon University, for example. Um, the ISTE course, let me minimize this and I'll pull a couple of these things up for you to check out as well. So they have the courses and they, you know, it's not offered all the time, but you can check it out uh, on there if you are a member that you can get access to the syllabus. But part of what you get, you know, you have that book that's available there and you can also get graduate credit too. So if you're looking to like, you know, up your skills a little bit, uh, AI 4K12 is an organization, uh, David Turetsky, who is at Carnegie Mellon. And I got to go there a couple of years ago and, and, you know, speak with him and also learn there's a robot Cosmo that he was help, trying to get me to figure out how to code. And I was getting frustrated. I'm like, I, I can't do this. He's like, no, you have to, this is the, the process that we want our students to go through. So you have to experience it yourself, but they have this website it has a lot of different things here. As I scroll through, you know, there's different books that they have that you can check out. Uh, there's different events. There is also a mailing list, a listserv that you can sign up to that people share papers they've written, research they've done, events that are coming up, competitions. Sometimes they're looking for presentations. Sometimes they're looking for contributors to uh, some different activities, people to review some things also. And I think, you know, as educators, like that's important that we connect as well, because there, especially in this area, there is so much to know that finding the time to do all of that research and get started with it can be a little bit tricky. But this is one site, the AI 4K12, that I definitely recommend that you uh, explore, and that is linked in the resources also. But let's say that you want students to, you know, read some really thick research base, or you want access to um, slides. So if I click on Let's see if this is the one. So here is from David Turetsky. Like I said, he's at CMU. But if you're looking for resources, and of course, teaching students digital citizenship, we want to say like, look, I'm using these materials from and bringing them in. But here is a 37-page PDF document available for free on this site. And so if you're thinking, you know what, I would love to get started with this. There's so many things. I just wish I had like boom, boom, boom. Here you go. Here is some breakdown about some of the technologies, for example, Roombas. I have a Roomba. I haven't used it in a while, but I mean, that falls under the AI, but you could easily, and the more that you do this and engage with it and the content and you work with the students, you, you learn more yourself. Of course, it's hard to keep up with because it's changing every day, but you can get um, as, you know, very basic level to very advanced as you want. And so I like that for us, you know, you can scroll through here and find a lot of helpful um, infographics, some things that really just give you that visual. Uh, there are some other things here on like Teachable Machine, why kids should learn about AI. So if I just click on that one too, some of them go to videos. Well, that one's not available anymore. <laughs> That's okay. I, I, it sounded like a great one, but this is another good website to use. Also, and I'll click on this other one too, AI for All is, again, you know, you have a lot of different materials, uh, they're, they're programs. So students can get involved in some summer programs. It has information about uh, AI, like why students should learn about it. And then even at different times, you find people have shared like web or not web slideshows, for example, on, you know, bias, ethics, algorithms, you name it, all of these topics related to AI. And then if you go into like open learning, here are some other materials that you can use for teaching. And it tells you about students, like what they'll learn, the different curriculums. If you're looking at the NGSS standards, ISTE standards, Common Core. But what I like about this is especially like the deep fakes, for example, or drawings. So if I click on it, 
it opens up to some different materials and you can preview. Now, this is what I use in my eighth grade class. Last year, I found this and I started to use it. And actually, we just worked on the AI and ethics lesson um, this past week. But some of them are just short, one hour. Facial recognition was a great one. But when you click on teach this lesson, it gives you access to the slides and then the teaching guide and everything, and even a worksheet. So if I click on this, I'll just show you this one because it's phenomenal. And it's also under Creative Commons. So you can use it and not worry about it. But going through, it gives you everything that you need. So it gives you some discussion topics. And if I skip through, they have videos. Um, so you, they're already embedded in the slides. It has some other examples, more discussion topics, and then give students prompts. And I mean, there is so much here, <laughs> like if, as I scroll through even more videos and if I scroll down, there are 103, this is like almost like my slideshow, 103 slides in this one, all available again for free with the AI and I'll do a preview here or I'll click on this one, the teaching guide. So you can also download this. It shows you what standards also again, licensed under Creative Commons, and it gives you everything that you need so you can go through it. So do you have to invest a lot of time? Not necessarily, just go through and read it and then just learn right along with your students because you know, we don't always have to be the one that's that are leading. We can facilitate and co-learn with our students as well. So I like this, I, I shouldn't say I like, I really like, I love the AI for all. And then Getting Smart had a series on artificial intelligence. Um, I had written several articles and so there is one of mine that talked about like this big growth in AI, especially during the time, you know, the COVID-19, the pandemic and some different events and things that were happening. Uh, facial recognition, Clearview AI is, and this has been updated. So this article I wrote, let me see, go back two and a half years ago now. Well, this number for Clearview AI, which is a facial recognition app used by a lot of law enforcement agencies, when they started, so they were in New York and somebody found out that they were taking images from the internet and using them to create this facial, facial recognition software. And they thought that they were violating all these laws. It turned out that they really weren't violating any laws because there wasn't any precedent for that because all the images were all available online. Just to, to emphasize how much this has grown, when I wrote this article, there were 3 billion images there are now more than 30 billion images stored in their database and they're using it. They've pulled them from social media sites, which again ties into the importance of teaching students about uh, digital citizenship. There have been a lot of things out of Pittsburgh. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, a friend, he's a professor, Po Shen Lo, he teaches um, math at Carnegie Mellon. He reached out to people online in his social network to see about creating an app. And he created the Novit app, which was a notification contract contact tracing app created. And it was the first of its kind. It was using ultrasound technology. Uh, there's math programs. You may have heard of Mathia, which is an adaptive learning program. Like I had mentioned that Socrates where students go through and it's like they have their own personal math coach, which again, you know, we might be in a classroom with 25 or 30 students. And we want to be able to work with every student every single day, but sometimes we can't be there, whether we're not physically in the classroom, students are working on something outside of class, or when we experience this, you know, teaching virtually or hybrid, but when students have that and they can work through it and it finds and tracks and can analyze their responses and provide them additional, you know, practice in a certain area that makes a bigger, a bigger difference for them. And then of course we have that time to interact with them, but that was just one of the articles I'd written. I, I put a link to several other ones. And the reason that I like writing these articles is because I can share a lot of these ideas. And if you say, I just want five ideas. So I wrote one of my first articles was teaching students about AI. And like I did with you, you know, what do you think about, where do we see it? What are some examples? And I mentioned some of those, like the email, the spam filter, uh, you know, the facial recognition software, the Netflix, all of those types of things. And then the other thing that I want, let me skip here for one second. I'm going to go to this one and I'm going to, I have a, the new thing that I mentioned earlier. So a couple of years ago also, it's, I always feel like I'm saying a couple of years ago, but it was uh, probably two and a half years ago, I think that ISTE created these hands-on AI projects because of course, recognize this growing need for students to develop skills in these areas and also recognize that, you know, teachers like me, like I would say, well, I'm just a Spanish teacher. I can't do this in my classroom or, you know, I teach third grade. How can I teach students about AI? So they reached out and they had educators working on creating these lessons and these projects for use in the classroom. And now there are these four guides. So I know there's elementary teachers, 
you might be secondary, you might be an elective teacher like myself, teaching Spanish uh, or computer science. So there are these four guys that have different, uh, oops, sorry about that, lessons available. So let me minimize this one again. And I think I did just take a screenshot for that, but the link for this is available in there. And what you get when you do this is you open it up and let's say you're elementary, you can find all the different projects and it has the standards, it has definitions, it has the time that you need, it has different activities uh, and lots of other materials for you. My lesson that I helped work on uh, with Susan Brooks and uh, Nancy Blair Black, who are phenomenal and oh, how could I forget this? So if you're not, if you are on Facebook and you're not already a member of, there's like an ISTE explorations group, or if you haven't explored this course, I would definitely recommend it, but they're always sharing amazing things. But these books, the lesson that I worked on was for translators and it, it wasn't so much, and especially like when we think about digital citizenship also, you know, for a long time, it was, it, I know I can say for myself, I was like, don't use translators. You use a translator, you get a zero. And I still stand behind that. Like if a student, one, if a student handwrites it and turns it in upside down, opposite way, I can tell from the very beginning they use a translator. One, I took a machine learning and translation course back, well, I won't say when it was, but it was a really long time ago. And two, if they're in Spanish one and they're writing something that's like, I don't even teach in four years of Spanish in high school, you know, it's a translator. So I, I tell them, if you cannot open up a dictionary and find that word or a short phrase in that book, then you're not using it correctly. So I stopped doing that. You shouldn't. And instead, okay, let's take a look at why you should or shouldn't. So one of the lessons is about using translators and how they work. And then also, you know, helping students to have more like confidence in themselves and being okay with making mistakes and learning. And then seeing where a human would understand, especially when it comes to language. So if I said to you, you know, my birthday's coming up, I really want a bat. Most people would think, that's great. She loves baseball, softball, whatever. She wants a bat. What if I wanted the animal bat for whatever reason? What if I just thought, you know what? I think a bat would make a great pet. When you type it into a translator, translator may not necessarily know. Now, if it's been programmed based on context and the rest of the sentence, it might understand like my birthday, I want a bat, but it may not know. So it might give you, you know, the flappy bat and not the baseball bat. Humans would understand. Or if I said, you know, I need a pen. You would probably think, oh, she wants a pen. Well, what if I have animals like a pig and I want to keep it in a pen? You wouldn't necessarily know that, nor would a translator. So the lesson that I help work on is having students go through and analyze uh, a translator versus their own. And when I did this with my Spanish three class, I intentionally created sentences where it might be skewed in one or the other direction where a human would be able to quickly sort through like the neural network and understand like, no, she totally doesn't mean like that animal back because that's just odd. Nobody would want that. And my students were like, wait a minute, how's it going to know if I mean this or this? I went, exactly. Like, how is it going to know that a human would understand, but a computer not necessarily? So uh, these are really great guides that are available. Now, as we wind down here, I want to share with you something that is super awesome. And I really hope that you will uh, sign up for this to give it a try because I, I was really amazed. So if you have not heard of Athena. It's um, Athena has been around for a while. I first learned about it, I think at the TCEA conference, it's probably made my first one and that could be almost five years ago. And it was for you know, like professional development. Now they have the AI coach. And anytime that I see something AI related, I want to dive right in and give it a try. And so that's what I did with this. And I'm pretty sure that I, I learned about this. It might've even come through in one of those Google email alerts that I had mentioned to you. So what it does, uh, you know, you think about observations and they can be uncomfortable. And for me, I always say like, just come in whenever you want, you know, like what you see is what you get. Just come on in. It's totally fine. Uh, or some people are like, no, don't observe me, but we need to get that feedback. And sometimes on the administrator side, it's hard for them to get out and do observations. I know with a lot of the administrators that I talk to, you know, my administrators are great in my school. They pop in. I always love having them come in just because it, they, they want to be around the students. They want to see what's happening. They want to give us feedback because we need the feedback. But sometimes that's hard to do. Also for us, you know, it's important that we have regular feedback and that can be uncomfortable or finding people to actually come in and observe us and give us feedback. So with this, what it is, it is a virtual coach that is powered by artificial intelligence and it guides you through it. So I have this fun code that's in the document and I can type it in also, uh, but you go through and you get actually PD credit 
but you set up your own goals and then you record yourself teaching a lesson. Uh, and then there's a process that it goes through. It's not just like you do the recording and you answer some questions and then you're done. It actually sends you reminders. It interacts with you. There are fun gifts, GIFs, however you want to call them that pop up. Um, and it kind of learns over time also. So I did this, I think, um, I started at the end of September and then it guides you to reflect on your practice. So I just took some screenshots. And I'm going to actually show you this here, but it has a conversation. So if we're looking at artificial intelligence, you know, the chat bot over here on the left. So the blue would be the person like, I'm looking to try something new. So then based on what you type in, it has been programmed to have different questions to prompt maybe you to think about something, to ask you about your teaching. And it goes through, it's like, okay, well, think about areas you're exploring. So then I want students to be more independent learning, one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And then it says, now let's align your priorities. Then it'll give you some suggested resources. So if you look here in this center one, it has articles and different resources like Edutopia, for example, I just picked the one in the center. It'll give you based on what you've typed in that you're expressing, to it, your AI coach, it'll give you some resources to read, or it could be a video, it could be different things for you. And now thinking about, you know, our professional learning, here we are on a Saturday or whenever you're watching this, we're taking time out to learn about something. We need that feedback to, you know, build our skills, of course, but we may not always have access to somebody, a person, a human to come in and give that to us, or we may not necessarily have the time to go out and find these things and know what are the best choices for us which is where this AI comes in. Now on the top right, that would be an example of what like it would look like when you go through this. And so, like I said, when I went through this, I was like, wow, this is like really amazing what it does. And it guides you through each component of it. So you have the video, there's a reflection log, and then there's some resources. And it says on the top right, it may be hard to see, but I'll read it. It says tag at least two strengths and two notes. I'll be here when you're done. So what you do is you have your video, and right up here, it has strengths and note. So you could go through and as you, you know, you see, here's the teacher in this case. Um, I can show you mine here shortly. You see where you are and you're like, oh, this was like a great part of my lesson. And then you type a note in and then you see another part. You type a, a strength, then you type another note. And then on the right side, it has some prompting questions for you. And then you would click, okay, I'm done. So then it has some different goal areas that you could click. And these is when you start. So it says select up to three. So you go through and you read them and you're like, yeah, you know, I really want to focus on um, diversity, equity, inclusivity, for example, or I want to like increase students' engagement, or I want to differentiate, for example. So you pick them and then it guides you to it. So this is the code to do it. And I'm going to stop screen sharing here in one minute and show you what this actually looks like in my dashboard because it was again not just like a quick like okay i recorded it i answered it okay move on it is seriously like you have a real coach there to support you ongoing throughout this period that you choose so let me minimize this and uh close out that so when you go to it it has like video coaching it has library but it's this ai coach and on my document I have this oh, do that link right there and I'll type it into the chat. And at the very least, I, I recommend that you that you sign up for it because it may be something that you like, oh yeah, well, I, I, I honestly think you should try it out because I was like, wow. So what you do is you you can record the video. And when I first did this, I just used, wow, that was in August. Goodness, I thought that was sooner. And I have another account too, but this is the one, the first time I did it. So you could record your video, like set up on your computer, depending on your classroom. Now, the first time I did this, I wanted to try just to go through it and experience it without like the students and the classroom, plus with the privacy and recording, I didn't have all that set up or anything yet. So I recorded my video and it was in there and it and I completed it. Now, if you look on the right, it says, bonjour, welcome back, Rochelle Denae. Are you ready to start a new coaching cycle? Yes, I'm ready. So it's thinking you can record or upload a new video. So I am going to, um, oh, hang on one second here. I clicked it and then it disappeared. Let's see. I will try to find a quick video. I had one from the other day and 
we'll see how long it takes. It's it's not the actual one, but uh, Dr. Desiree is actually in this one. It was for a course that I had to do an assignment in, but let me go back to this while that's loading. So it takes you through, it has your video, and then it prompts you, and then it'll say, okay, we're done with this part. Now, when do you want to set this for your next goal, for example? And you pick a date on the calendar, and it'll send you an email, and then it'll send you a reminder, and then you log back in. It gives you this nice greeting, so you really do feel like you are engaging with somebody as a coach. So the AI component of it, you know, it has a chat bot. It's using your responses. And the best part about it, well, there's a lot of best part about, parts about it, but one of the best parts about it is that reflection log. So the information, as it prompts you to think about your teaching and your instruction and the methods you've used and to look at your video and to reflect, uh, finding time for ourselves to sit down and to write a reflection can be like, I don't have the time to do that. It does it for you. It takes all of the text that you've typed in and it generates your own reflection log. So I've uploaded my video and it'll take a little time to process because it's a little bit longer. And so you go through while when it's it tells you start the coaching cycle and it just prompts you through everything that you need. It's still processing it. So anyway, you're gonna take my word for it for right now. But it asks you different questions and then you type in your answers and then it helps you think about things. And then again, at the end, you have this reflection log and I'll click on this and it has like strength summary, like all of these things that you see on the left side are different parts of it. And over here, it says, in the meantime, I'm wishing you happy trails and engaged students. That's all folks. But every so often it pops up like images and a welcome goodbye. It has a certificate of completion, but everything that you've typed in, it also asks you questions to push your thinking. It tracks your progress across, you know, across time, has a summary of your notes and um, different comments. You can download the PDF. It has other resources and things available that you can add. Um, so it, it is really awesome. And I was amazed when I did it. I was a little bit nervous too, because like I recorded myself doing like a lesson, but just kind of going through it. But then thinking about and sitting down and typing responses and just having that comfort level build up, but also being able to see myself teaching a lesson and to think through it and have that interaction and the fun things that pop up too. Like it did make it more personal and like a human component of it in a sense, because you actually felt like you were having this conversation. You know, you type in like, that's all folks, bye. And it's pretty great. So that Athena, I would definitely recommend that um, you try out if you haven't already signed up for it, just to get that experience because there, there is nothing else like it. And uh, I'm looking forward to using it again and going through that process because it definitely helps, especially if you're just looking for feedback on how many times do I say, you know, do I, do I use, um, and I know that I've used, um, I try not to, but like it happens, or I find myself saying a certain word like, so, so, okay, I'm going to breathe. When I feel like I'm going to say that word, I'm going to breathe and like you catch it, but it's more comfortable because you're seeing it and recognize it yourself if you don't have the opportunity to have a colleague or administrator uh, observe you. So that is another great one. And then the last thing, because I know we're, we're done. So all of the things that I've shared, there are some things in here that I didn't get a chance to talk about, like this auto auto AI, this AI world school has some resources, but I wanted to make sure that I gave a lot of things that kind of you expand upon, like those AI experiments, different chatbots, uh, the blogs. This is the test that I was telling you about where it's a human versus AI that you go through and you can have students do. Um, I have the link in there for the Athena. And then I have a lot of other articles that I've written. And then I have the link to uh, the AI. But the other part about this is I have my ARVR stuff in here because it's all kind of connected a little bit. So if you have questions, let me know at any point, whether now or later, there are links. Um, if I don't know the answer to something, which could happen, I will gladly try to find an answer for you and uh, help you out as much as I can. So I thank you for joining in, especially on a Saturday. And Dr. Desiree, thank you as well for everything. I'm going to drop this one last link into the chat. Thank you so much. That was really, it was awesome, but it was also just really interesting about, <laughs> you know, like we think of AI, at least me, I'm always thinking of like robots, they're going to take yeah. over, the, but we're using AI every day. And it's just really interesting to, to kind of see that and put it in your head. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for yeah. not only joining us during 
a conference, but also <laughs> the Saturday before Thanksgiving. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. Good to see you all again. And I want to see pictures. If you did the AI club, the cartoon, even if you just email it to me, I would like to see it because you saw mine, my live selfie one on there. <laughs> <laughs>